I'm uh, just trying to give you an idea about how these uh, techniques, which are uh, based on uh, natural processes, which are quite uh, uh, slow uh, processes, we are not putting energy inside, we are not consuming or trying to push the, the speed of uh, the processes for controlling the, uh, both the quantity and the quality of the water in our urban and uh, natural environments. And uh, all these should uh, uh, go in the direction of uh, integrating these uh, uh, services provided by ecosystems in uh, modern uh, urban, urban planning and environmental planning. That's why the title is uh, Integration of Ecosystem Services in Urbanized Areas. So before uh, to start uh, showing the, the approach, I would like to give you the scaring vision of an environmental chemist about uh, the future which is uh, uh, we are going to face uh, quite soon. I am a very smiling and uh, optimistic guy. Uh, I've lived uh, quite happy for uh, all my life, but my vision for the next future, if we go straight in the direction we are uh, walking in the, on the pathway we are walking now, is not optimistic at all. So the first 10 minutes will be just something that you should remember as a scaring experience. So the first thing you know very well that only a very small amount of water in the water cycle uh, which works this way and the more we uh, waterproof the soil uh, the faster we will uh, get uh, the, the runoff, the rain going to the uh, collecting bodies and uh, we have uh, some uh, water which has the right quality for being used. It's really that very small uh, little percentage in uh, the whole cycle, what we are able to use now if we don't find any uh, free source of energy that for the moment is just a futuristic dream, uh, we will have to deal with that small, uh, small percentage and we, we can't use all the rest of the water because it, it contains too much salt and the process for this, uh, desalinating the water is too much expensive at the moment. Uh, so we have to work with this and uh, that little uh, percentage there is even not available for everyone. It's not spread in an even way in the world. Uh, the lakes in between Canada and North America are the biggest reservoir of fresh water in the world, but they are there. <laughs> they are used only by the Canadians and the Americans. Uh, so uh, it's not even that amount that is available in the world. We are really have to work with very, very small amounts of resource. So the resource is important and water scarcity is the first problem. What you see here is a model which is only based on the growth of population and assuming a consumption of 50 liters per person per day. And you see that all the red colored areas will uh, face very severe problems of uh, uh, water scarcity in a nearby future, which means wars, conflicts and so on. Then we have, uh, the, we use the water and then we don't take care of cleaning it up before to give it back to the environment. So we still have that the 80% of the wastewater in developing countries discharged without any treatment. It's the 60% at worldwide level. So a lot of the, the water we are using. Uh, a lot of industries are not adding a cost on the product which is uh, related to cleaning the resources they are using pr for producing uh, their products. And uh, this is meaning that at the end they are discharging untreated wastewater in, uh, in the rivers. Then we are growing as population, so we need to force uh, the production of food. And for doing this, we are helping our uh, bacteria, which are living everywhere in the, uh, on the planet, like the nitrifiers, for instance, which are fixing the nitrogen from the atmosphere. Uh, for transforming it in a ionic form available for life. Uh, and uh, we are adding nitrates 
on the soil in order to give them uh, uh, to give to the plants uh, available food and for making them uh, growing faster. The problem is that when it rains, a lot of nitrates and pesticides are just uh, washed out and they go in the rivers and are producing eutrophication effects in uh, the receiving water bodies. There are two uh, biogeochemical cycles that we have been able to modify drastically in only one century and a half, so since the start of the industrialization period. The first one you know very well is the carbon cycle, and we are transforming a lot of uh, uh, negative uh, oxidation numbers or uh, reduced uh, uh, carbon to the maximum form of oxidized carbon, CO2, uh, and we are producing a lot of CO2 which goes in the atmosphere, um, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, which is creating the greenhouse effect. And uh, uh, this process is uh, bringing to the climate change, that is this one, and all the, I'm, I could uh, spend uh, half an hour talking about all the, this, these bad effects uh, which are related to the climate change, but I, I bet that most of you are knowing them already. Uh, so just know that everything is going to be more drastic in the next years if we don't take care about the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And then the other one is the nitrogen cycle. Here we are, uh, for, thank you to, thanks to, to colleagues of mine, they, one of them got also Nobel for this. Uh, they invented, uh, Haber and Bosch invented a reaction which is uh, transforming the nitrogen N2 in the atmosphere, 70% of the air, into a ionic form using a catalyzer and spending one barrel of petrol for one ton of nitrate, uh, ammonium nitrate produced. So we are spending energy for transforming and uh, using a sink, the atmosphere, for transforming nitrogen in an av available form. Uh, there, are, there were bacteria doing this, but they were too slow for our needs. We needed much more food than uh, what the nature was producing. And therefore, uh, putting nitrates on the soil, we have produced slowly an enrichment of nitrates everywhere in the world. This was the situation in uh, 1860. And you see that there were already some problems just here in India. I don't know why, probably tea production. <laughs> I don't know why in that part of India there were already some uh, nitrates deposited in there in that century. But what, oops, uh, what we see that uh, in the 90s, most of the uh, more inhabited parts of the planet uh, are already quite affected by these ni uh, nitrogen oxide uh, deposits. And uh, uh, just know that when we reach the 5,000 uh, milligram per me, uh, square meter per year, uh, that soil becomes too rich in nitrates, uh, it's uh, hyper-fertilized, and it will not be usable anymore for agriculture. So we are going to lose land uh, that, is, uh, the, that has the right quality for growing food. So it's a process uh, f that we are speeding up for the moment for getting more food, but will bring us in a few years to have no lands to be used for the purposes. The model is really, this is obviously a model and uh, is a forecast for 2050. And you can see that there are several purple areas which will uh, really unused and all the red ones are uh, not giving <laughs> good signals for getting better. So probably after other 50 years, most of these colored areas will be uh, unusable. That's a big problem. <laughs> the other one, which is strictly linked to the nitrogen, there are three elements which are essential for plants, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, and uh, uh, calcium, so potassium. And uh, uh, the phosphorus is available only as rock. Uh, it's not a cycle. Uh, you just get the phosphorus out from mines and then uh, you purify it and put it in the fertilizers. The mines in the world are going to be exhausted very soon. This model is saying that in 2070, if, uh, I don't know, India and China are increasing a bit their consumption and so we can uh, think to those uh, increase like 2% or 2.5%, uh, into this century we will end up the phosphorus. And at the moment we are just 
eating the phosphorus and then re ejecting it. Uh, it goes uh, at the end, if it is not recovered, on the bottom of the oceans. And if we don't invent small robots which are going <laughs> uh, on the bottom of the seas, collecting phosphorus, uh, it, it's uh, almost impossible to recover it. And that's the other uh, big issue. No phosphorus, no food, is saying in, in that graph. So those are the three main concerns. Then we still have uh, about 2.5 billion which have no access to sanitation, and this is creating a lot of healthy issues. Uh, um, about 1 billion which is practicing open defecation, uh, which is distributed like this way. Uh, is the percentage of countries without access to improved sanitation. And I just want to show you that all this has a cost. We are paying about, at worldwide level, 260 billion per year uh, just for paying back the damages which are created uh, in terms of environmental impacts and the health uh, issues uh, for not taking care uh, of the uh, sanitation and the management of uh, water and wastewater. Uh, therefore, the World Bank is saying that if you invest one dollar in sanitation, you can easily get back five times more <laughs> as a payback of your investment. Because uh, obviously, uh, if you invest, you are going to save uh, part of these uh, 260 million we were saying before. Uh, so it could be an interesting uh, sector uh, for, uh, for the market, but it's not considered so much at the moment. What can we do? For now, the scary part is finished, and I'm going to talk about the solutions. What can we do? The first simple thing is the water saving. And the water saving can be implemented a lot uh, just uh, reusing the water or recycling it several times. Uh, then we can integrate the sources instead of using the groundwater, for instance, or the superficial uh, um, water like rivers or lakes. Uh, we can uh, try to implement as much as possible the rainwater harvesting, which is a bit hard in some countries because the uh, rain is uh, stochastically distributed uh, along the year, so it's uh, uh, just a matter to understand how much the investment can be paid back by the quantities you can collect and store for a long period for the droughts period in which uh, you need it. And finally, the most modern trends are uh, defined by this acronym ROS, Resource Oriented Sanitation. And especially in countries like India where you still have a lot of uh, uh, sanitation uh, issues to be solved, I strongly suggest to go in this direction instead of adopting the wrong approach we adopted in uh, North America, Europe and so on to build the big sewers and make centralized treatment, uh, mixing all the uh, substances together in a unique solution. Uh, the nutrients recovery uh, is uh, mainly based on uh, uh, segregation of the fluxes uh, since the very beginning, so at the household level. And that's why you architects are exactly the kind of audience that should get the message, because you are designing the buildings. And uh, uh, the, the approach, this uh, resource-oriented sanitation, is uh, household-centered, so the, uh, you can obtain the best results if you start from the design of the units, the productive units which are generating substances. So the water saving with small, uh, a very small investment, some uh, few thousands of uh, rupees, you can uh, buy devices that you can adopt in the house. One of the most effective is the double uh, flush toilet. And you can save uh, up to 20-30% of the uh, consumption of a family just uh, with a very small investment. Uh, then you can instead uh, uh, increase a lot your potential of reuse. For instance, uh, segregating the grey water, so having two pipes which are going out of the house, one for the black water, which is the one produced by the water closet, and one uh, uh, which is bringing instead the water from the showers, the kitchen, the taps, and so on in the house, which is defined grey water. The grey water is much less polluted than the black water. The black water is uh, 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 containing fecal matter, 
uh, is uh, really unbiodegradable. The fecal matter is uh, uh, processed organic uh, compounds which are already processed by a very effective anaerobic reactor, our intestine, and so uh, the, the, it's really hard to, uh, for the bacteria to get rid of uh, the substances that uh, our body has not be a, be a, been able to process. If we dilute these uh, uh, hardly degradable substances in a uh, higher volume, in a bigger volume of water, we are just transferring this uh, unbiodegradable character to uh, the whole solution. Instead, it's much better to keep them separated and to uh, treat them in a different way, where the black water should be the source of uh, nutrients and uh, carbon to be recovered. The grey water instead can be an effective source of good quality water to be reused. This is, for instance, an installation, the two on the right, and you see how close they are to the houses, and they, they are wastewater treatment plants. They are both processing grey water that is then reused inside the buildings, for instance, for toilet flushing or external uses like gardening. Uh, this triangular one instead is treating the rainwater, which is uh, collected by the parking lot. The engines of the cars are releasing a lot of uh, bad uh, organic substances, uh, hydrocarbons mainly, and uh, uh, they are filtered in a, a sand filter. It's like one meter of sand. Most of the organics are uh, retained there and then slowly degraded, and the effluent uh, is, uh, uh, has a uh, sufficient good quality for uh, being reused, obviously not for drinking, but for a lot of other usages in the house. Uh, in uh, uh, India, we have worked in a project in Nawatek, which ended uh, just the last December, and uh, uh, we uh, made uh, just uh, uh, some uh, demonstration projects and uh, demonstration units in uh, Pune and Nagpur. I wanted to show here that uh, uh, in that uh, graph on uh, the right, that the urines, which are only 500 liters per person per year, so at, with a common septic tank, you could collect them all and send them to the chemical industry, which can uh, get the nitrogen already at the right form instead of using the Haber-Bosch reaction that I was mentioning before. So uh, being able to separate, segregate the urine in uh, every house could save uh, enough money uh, because then you don't have to treat it in the wastewater treatment plant and you don't have to uh, produce the uh, nitrogen, uh, reduced nitrogen by the atmosphere. And we could save at a worldwide level enough money with, with, with this approach for paying the food for all Africa every year. So we are not talking of small amounts of money. And it's just a different approach to what we are doing now, which is to mix everything. The grey water doesn't contain nitrogen, so it's uh, perfect for, uh, uh, for being treated without having these two phases of the treatment of wastewater, which are uh, the most costly one. In a treatment of wastewater, if you have only to get rid of suspended solid and carbon, uh, you can pay something like uh, uh, $0.1 per cubic meter, uh, if you have to treat the nitrogen, the price goes to three times uh, 0 0.1. So uh, in a very industrial and well-managed process, you pay 0 0.3. Uh, so segregating the grey water um, could make the uh, total cost of uh, the treatment uh, strongly reduced. Uh, there are several reasons for which uh, grey water should be recycled and the most important is that the biggest amount uh, of water we produce in the house, 70-75% is grey water. So if you segregate it and reuse closed loop at the wastewater treatment plant at the end of the pipe, you only will get the 30%, which means uh, one third of the uh, current uh, operation and management cost. Uh, okay, more biodegradable and then we have another Nice thing, that is, if you make a grey water treatment plant which is recycling closed loop in the same uh, uh, building, uh, the uh, demand is uh, linked directly to the production. If all the palace is going for holidays uh, somewhere else, there is no need 
and there is no production. If they are all there, and so they, there is the need of consumption, they are also uh, producing enough, uh, enough water. So there is a direct link which is uh, quite good in still in terms of uh, operation and management. Uh, the big issue we faced in uh, Pune and Nagpur was that we were visiting case studies and we were not finding available land, even though uh, for uh, treating the grey water we need uh, for the wetlands something about one square meter per person in uh, warm uh, uh, climate countries, in hot ca climate countries like this one, I'm sweating, uh, <laughs> we can have uh, even 0 0.5 uh, square meters per person. I recommend when we started working here in India, we have seen that the experiences on natural treatment systems were much shrinked in comparison to what the international literature is suggesting. So you are using plants which are like 10 times uh, narrower in, in uh, dimension in comparison to the rest of the world. And I bet, and there, are, there is not a good perception, at least in the high authorities, about these natural treatment systems because of uh, uh, some uh, uh, bad experiences and failures. So I strongly suggest to the designers to follow the international guidelines because they are coming from about 30, 40 years of experiences. And so there is nothing to invent. In Italy, we started something like 20 years uh, in late in comparison to other countries in Europe. And we didn't uh, invent something new. We just adopted the best uh, findings of the other uh, researchers or other practitioners uh, in Europe, in North America, in Canada, and so on. Uh, so the first problem we had in India was no land available. And the idea was, OK, go vertical. And uh, uh, go vertical means that uh, we intend to use green walls for filtering the gray water, collecting it at the, bot uh, the bottom, and then uh, repumping it back to the apartments. So you can see a lot of green walls that can have uh, several interesting functions. Uh, they make air filtration, oxygen production, CO2 storage. They reduce, they have a thermal effect on, uh, on the walls, so they can make a sort of insulation, uh, which uh, reduce the energy, both for warming the apartment and for cooling it. Um, there are microclimate effects in the area, if you think to a lot of these green walls spread in the city. Uh, you can increase the biodiversity. My wife at this point, point is saying, I don't want lizards in my window, but <laughs> as a scientist, I, instead I like anyway the biodiversity. The lizards will eat the mosquitoes. Um, they reduce the noise pollution and then can increase the longevity of the building because uh, there is less exposure to the atmosphere. Um, they obviously provide some aesthetic efforts. What we wanted to check in the process uh, in the project was, can they provide the wastewater treatment? Yes, after uh, one year of monitoring, we can say that this uh, kind of installation, these uh, pots are, pro are produced by a Mumbai uh, company. So we uh, found an Indian provider. Uh, outside here, there is a Portuguese company, uh, which is uh, uh, showing the, their products, quite similar to these ones. So with six spots, we are already reaching a quality of the water, which is the right one for uh, being reused for uh, irrigation of the gardens or uh, for flushing toilets. And th th those are just uh, some uh, renderings. Uh, no, the one on the right is a rendering of a building in uh, Tunisia. Uh, the other idea, still not having uh, surfaces uh, um, on the ground, was, OK. Uh, we can go vertical or otherwise we can use the roofs. So as a green roof, we can make an active green roof. And this is a project that has been made uh, in uh, the Serengeti Park in Tanzania. And uh, there is a new resort which has been built there. Uh, over that one, we uh, have designed a rooftop wetland, which is a horizontal flow constructed wetland, filled up with a, a lightweight clay aggregate, 
which is a quite light material because obviously you are adding weight on top of your building. So the structurist, the engineer or the architect has to calculate how much weight you will put on the roof before. And uh, so this solution is not so perfect for retrofitting existing uh, buildings, only if they can uh, really support the new weight. Uh, or otherwise uh, has to be uh, applied when you are realizing um, uh, n new realizations. <coughs> so, uh, well, there are some values, but I'm not entering so much in detail. Anyway, you can see the beamer is not working. Um, sorry, the pointer. Uh, you can see that in the horizontal flow beds, they are always saturated. There is a blue line there. So uh, the water is constantly at that level. It enters from one side and goes down from the drainage pipe on the opposite side. And uh, it's a plug flow reactor, so the only losses of water are due to the evapotranspiration, which is the evaporation mediated by the plants. Uh, it's perfect for uh, reusing it. Obviously, the hottest is the climate in the country. The uh, highest is the loss uh, by evapotranspiration. In the worst situation, the losses are, uh, are anyway about the 30-35%. There are even easier solutions if you don't want to treat the grey water and you want to reuse it only for toilet flushing, for instance. You can you adopt these uh, very nice devices. You wash your hands, and then you get the bucket and use it, use it for other kind of uh, poor usages in the house. And another uh, architectural design is this one. Uh, inside the, the first one, you could even insert some fibers for filtering, but then you need to replace them and to clean them. And uh, the second uh, uh, surface there is just for uh, storage and then for flushing the toilet. This is even quite nice and uh, just installing this can save the 30% of water that you are using every day for flushing the toilet. Okay, then, uh, so gray water treatment, which is then bringing uh, your water saving potential to about 60-65% then if you add also another source that can be still at a household level like the collection and the harvesting of rainwater um, you can reach uh, about 80 percent of the water saving uh, from uh, uh, of the water that you get from the tap that is the, the uh, uh, one that you are paying for uh, there are very nice uh, systems uh, in uh, in the market with uh, some uh, smart units which are deciding where to send the rainwater and for instance if you plan uh, the ideal house where the uh, rainwater is uh, used for the um, heating bodies like uh, the washing machine or the uh, dishwasher then you can uh, save the life of these uh, devices uh, because you have no deposition of uh, carbonates on uh, the uh, heating bodies and so the efficiency is much higher than uh, uh, if you use uh, water with a certain hardness inside. Rainwater is uh, the most clean water we can have available uh, if we don't uh, get it dirty <laughs> somewhere during the collection phase. Okay, now I'm going in the urban scale. So the nat natural water balance is just in a pristine uh, terrain. Is, uh, you have the precipitation, you have the evaporation or evapotranspiration, some runoff, which is the, the water which is not able to penetrate in the ground, and the infiltration, which is instead storing the water as uh, groundwater. Groundwater has been the uh, best resource of water for years and years of the humanity development. Uh, but nowadays we have been able to put a lot of risk and uh, even to damage and completely destroy some of our natural uh, resources which were accumulated there in millions of years. And uh, it's quite simple to ruin them if you add, for instance, uh, some uh, threolin, which is uh, a solvent used for uh, uh, dry washing uh, your clothes. Uh, it will remain in the groundwater for 130 years before to be degraded. 
So it's quite easy to put some su substances uh, inside for, I don't know, unknown reasons, uh, uncontrolled industrial uh, processes and so on. And once they are there, all the community will have to pay the price for this. And this is exactly what is happening uh, with, with the groundwater. Once we insert the pollution there, the processes are so slow that for uh, generations we, we will have to pay back the price. So the urban development is strongly modifying the natural uh, water cycle. And so we have uh, that the, you have to import the water from somewhere else if you don't have enough there, which is modifying the natural balances of each hydrographic basin, uh, uh, reduced evapotranspiration and a bigger runoff, which is inc increasing the flooding risk in the rivers, uh, reduced infiltration, and so you don't re have recharge of your groundwater reservoirs. Uh, then you produce wastewater, and if you don't treat it, it is creating damages at the end in the receiving bodies. And okay, those are all the impacts I just uh, uh, cited right now. Uh, there is one approach which is called water sensitive urban design, which is tending to minimize the impacts of the, the bad impacts of the urbanization and trying instead to get back to the pristine uh, configuration. And so we want to uh, still uh, uh, manage the precipitation to increase a bit the evapotranspiration, reduce the run runoff, increase the infiltration and recycle as much as possible and not discharge or reduce the discharge of the wastewater. And if we have to discharge something, it too should be clean. So those are the cycles, potable, uh, wastewater, stormwater, and you see that only the central part is called integrated water cycle management, and that's the principle of the sustainability of uh, the uh, water management approach at urban level, which is uh, also here. Uh, so the technique can be defined also, the approach can be defined also as uh, SUDS, 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 Sustainable Urban Drainage Systems, which are uh, part of the water-sensitive urban design. What, which kind of benefits are uh, these, uh, uh, is this uh, um, sustainable drainage providing? It's a mitigation and the, the adaptation to the climate change, so increase of the resilience of the cities. Uh, they increase the biodiversity because we are creating natural ecosystems inside the city. Uh, there is a renewal of the infrastructures, which is another big issue. For instance, Germany was uh, um, presenting a study done a few years ago where their need to renew their very well done uh, sewer system at national level, bringing it to the adequate sizing for the growth of population and the increase of the urbanized areas, they should invest all their golden reserve in their national bank for doing this. And so they have decided, well, that's not the, what we can do. And Germany at the moment is the best uh, country in Europe in economic terms, and they have decided, okay, we can't face uh, the uh, renewal of our infrastructures because we don't have the money for doing this. So the only way is to try to change approach. And they are one of the uh, biggest promoters of uh, the sustainable um, uh, uh, drainage and sustainable approaches in, uh, in water management. Then uh, if you are able to store the drops of rain where they fall, uh, instead of bringing them uh, somewhere else or letting them go in the rivers, you have the uh, possibility to store some volumes that then can be reused for the cities. Just think to how much water we are uh, using for uh, washing the streets, for instance. And why to use tap water for washing the streets? There is no need. You can use the rainwater collected somewhere. And then we can have aesthetic improvements and more livable cities. So. Before the pipe, we should think to everything that is able to store and keep the water, the drop of rain where it falls. Green roofs are the first one, permeable paving, filtering trenches, 
which are linear structures, you should realize everywhere you have a street, a parking lot, and then something bigger like vegetated retention areas, rain gardens, which are a, a genial invention. Uh, and if you want to store even more, you can transform, for instance, a roundabout in a street, in a little pond, or in an extended retention basin. The scale of intervention can be inside the city, uh, at the border of the city, and here we should have an integration with the agricultural practices, even giving them uh, nutrients recovered by the resource-oriented sanitation which should be the perfect way to manage the thing. And even extra urban interventions like a highway, which is a highly pollutant, uh, polluting uh, infrastructure that could be treated by linear structures like uh, these trenches. If you go in Canada and uh, all the highways have already these uh, long uh, read communities along, along the, their highways. So before pipe, uh, you should collect uh, the rainwater, for instance, in pools, like, like the one in uh, the picture, or uh, you can use vegetated retention strips, which are just uh, uh, one, two meters deep channels filled with some rocks or gravel, where the water can be accumulated inside. There is a throttle, a small pipe, which is giving back the water in 48 hours, instead that in a few minutes. And in this way, you control the flooding risk, which is one of the more uh, costly um, uh, practices to pay back for the damages from the floodings uh, that could be prevented simply implementing this kind of infrastructures everywhere. Uh, if you are not able to retain the water before the pipe and you have the pipe, uh, then in the pipe the engineers are putting a lot of safety devices which are called uh, combined sewer overflows. These are the cause of uh, uh, pollution for our rivers. In Europe, we should have reached the quality, uh, the good quality of the rivers this year. Uh, any of the European countries has reached it, and the main cause is that uh, these uh, sewer overflows are still bringing a lot of tons of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and other pollutants in the rivers uh, just uh, by diluting the sewer with the rain. And if you, don't, uh, if you are not able uh, to keep the water before, then you have to treat on spot these combined sewer overflows before uh, to permit their discharge in the river. And there are some solutions with uh, natural systems. One very nice experiment was, uh, is uh, in Berlin, uh, the reunification from uh, East and West uh, uh, Germany. Uh, some architects uh, had to design the Chrysler a new building and they got a permission to discharge in the river on the right only seven liter per second. They were very far from this value. They were producing much more water uh, during the, the rain events. And so what they did was to be, uh, build a big reservoir, uh, green roofs everywhere, recycle of the grey water, uh, cisterns in the ground. Uh, doing all this, at the end, they have been able to reach, reach the number. And you see how nice all these look. And there are, uh, the water for keeping uh, a good quality is continuously recycled in a reed bed, in a constructed wetland, which is just in the middle of the city. Uh, that's the picture there. So you can integrate everything, uh, a good management, ma uh, management of the water with a nice urban uh, design. <clears throat> and that's how we would like to see every design made uh, by the urban planners. So uh, structures which are slowing down uh, the, the rain events, uh, collecting it in a natural way in a central body which still can retain the water and give it back after 48 hours, uh, slowing down the hydraulic peak which is uh, not concentrated in few hours after the uh, start of the rain event, but instead it, it goes long, long. And in this way you can control both the quantity and also the quality uh, of the water you are going to discharge. Those are some examples, but my time is uh, <laughs> running out, so I go very fast here. Uh, anyway, just think that, uh, for instance, that strip uh, of uh, grass, one meter of grass can already uh, remove about the 30-40% of the solids 
and in the rainwater there are not so many. So uh, at the end, if you just make this filtration before to go in the sewer, you let the, the water running over a, g a grass strip, which is very simple, um, you can already reduce a lot the pollution created by uh, the rainwater, which is uh, washing out the roofs and so on. Okay, for parking lots, you can do something like this. I don't enter in the details. Uh, you see, uh, anyway, those are just uh, waterproofed uh, excavations with some gravel inside. Uh, the gravel is a perfect support for bacteria. A biofilm is growing over there, and the biofilm is uh, responsible then of all the removal processes. You can build ponds and uh, uh, at, uh, yeah, um, a extra urban level, you can work on uh, a highway. This is a, a system we realized in Italy, where every five half uh, kilometer, we have realized an infiltration unit, which has a treatment uh, uh, constructed wetland at the beginning, and then uh, uh, the in infiltration for uh, groundwater recharge. But you are infiltrating a good quality water. Oops, what happened? Yeah, so the, uh, uh, for this system, for the highways, why it's uh, turning off? Okay. Uh, it's quite interesting because if you have uh, an accident and there is a spillage of material of a liquid, which is not water, we have put some sen sensors in the first manual which are recognizing, okay, that's not water, and they close everything, and so you can... Uh, collect the possibly toxic liquid before to be discharged in the environment. Uh, just one second for this uh, <laughs> sector of the combined sewer overflows. It's really important to treat them for, uh, uh, for the quality of the environment. In terms of a green economy, that's a very promising market. I understand that here in India you still have to solve before the combined sewer overflows the 60% of uh, untreated, 90% uh, of untreated wastewater <laughs> before to treat this one. But anyway, for uh, uh, the developed, let's say, the, the uh, Western countries, uh, it's a market of uh, some billions uh, because each of uh, these realization is about one million of euro. Uh, but it's, uh, we are, uh, it's mandatory now to treat these uh, uh, combined sewer overflows uh, in a way or in the other. So we are just comparing the gray options made by concrete pumps and technical treatments with the uh, ecosystem services. And the realization cost is quite comparable. The, uh, operation and management cost is uh, instead uh, very reduced for the natural ones, which are creating then uh, green parks and uh, uh, appreciation by the population, which is uh, uh, using them for uh, public fruition, for uh, uh, just entertainment. We have a community of fishermen uh, which are uh, using this pond uh, uh, that is uh, uh, accumulating just the, the second flush of uh, of rainwater coming out of, of from the sewer. Uh, this is the, a similar system realized in France, si still for treatment of the combined sewer overflows. You can even pump out some water from uh, your nullas and put it in a big wetland. Uh, I don't believe that you can treat a uh, nulla uh, flow in a very small unit. You need hectares, so uh, you must uh, do it uh, outside of the city, most probably, uh, because the retention times of the water, so the contact time of the water with the natural system is what is determining uh, the performances and the removal of the pollutants. And some of your nullas are just like open sewers in uh, chemical uh, uh, terms. The concentration of pollutants are really, really high. And they, that's how these off-stream wetlands are looking like. So they are just reproducing natural wetlands. And the designers should just uh, study what uh, the natural wetlands are offering in the area, which kind of plants are uh, growing inside, which, which kind of animals, and so on, and try to reproduce an environment that can be uh, adaptable for uh, the natural populations. 
nice ideas for architects are what the biorefineries are uh, uh, proposing in this moment. You can have some uh, glass pipes with algae growing inside. You feed them with uh, wastewater, which is uh, containing, in these cases, the, the black water, what we need. So a lot of nutrients which are feeding the algae. Then you filter the algae and uh, you can get a lot of ethanol out of them or a lot of other good chemicals. So it's a chemical base primary uh, product that can be processed afterward. And they can in be inserted even along streets, uh, along the buildings. You can see this existing building uh, in Germany and these two renderings from uh, a Spanish architect, which is thinking to <laughs> put them in, uh, in squares, but they look nice up to me. So that could be one possible future. Another uh, futuristic one is the vertical farming that I like a lot. So the same building is uh, growing food, processing, producing the fertilizers, recycling the water, and it should, should be zero everything, <laughs> zero distance because you produce your food in your building, uh, zero waste, zero emission, zero pesticides, zero power. So that's the perfect sustainable building for the future if, you, if we uh, one day will be able to uh, design something like this. In uh, Milan, we have the first one, which is called the vertical hood. Uh, still, uh, they are not recycling so much, but at least uh, the appearance of the building is going to be sim something similar to this one. Okay, a few words for uh, concluding. Yeah, two minutes, so I'm <laughs> still in time. I'm uh, showing, uh, if you go to the IWA, website, there is a specialist group which is giving you continuously, because we share a lot, uh, every kind of technical information about uh, wetland systems. And uh, so the IWA, International Water Association, now they are changing websites, so I didn't put the address because I don't know what uh, will be the, the new one. Uh, as you can see here, maybe it's a bit little, but there are something like 300,000 papers published on wetlands. Nothing new to be invented. We know everything. It's a mature technology. Even though in some countries it's still not accepted, it's not accepted just because the transfer of knowledge was not so effective. And uh, so 300,000 papers is a mountain of papers. <laughs> and they are all peer-reviewed, so accepted by the international scientific community. Uh, there are several types, uh, kinds of wetlands which are classified like there, subsurface flow, surface flow, and uh, the, this uh, uh, classification can be extended. There are several times, upflow, downflow, variations, uh, uh, but they are all very well known and reported. So my advice is not to invent your own recipe, but just to use something that is referenced and where you can forecast very well in a, an engineered way what will happen in the lifetime of the system, that should be at least 30, 35 years, and not two, three years, and after you get it uh, clogged and not working anymore. Those are the simple configurations. I show you ju just a few. Uh, free water, subsurface, vertical. You can treat sludge if you want. Uh, they have advantages. The investment cost is comparable to the uh, other techniques with the technological systems, but the operational management cost is 10 times slower. So if you spread it on 30 years, you will have a big uh, saving of money. And they are very robust and reliable because uh, they are extensive treatment systems, so you have a buffer action and a lot of different processes that are taking place inside instead of a specialized community, as in the activated large plant, that is just one, two families of bacteria. Here you have hundreds of different bacterial families. There are some mites, which are, we have a too high footprint. It's true. <laughs> I mean, we, we are starting uh, years ago from four or five square meters per person. We can reach combining systems about, uh, in a passive way, two square meters or 1.5 square meters per person. We can't go below these numbers if the system remains passive. Uh, that, that's what I've learned in 30 years of experience. You can reduce it just enhancing the wetland. If you put some engineering inside, then you can go 
uh, to one tenth of this, and so to reach about 0 0.2 square meter per person. But you need to add aeration on the bottom, like in, in the uh, sketch below. So you put some pipes which are releasing some bubbles of oxygen, and then you can reduce the sides. Or otherwise, you can use tidal wetlands, so uh, the water is going up and down from one side to the other. But those are already including pumps, aeration, compressors, and so on. So you are putting energy in the system. It's not only the nature working, you are giving some uh, human inputs. Then they don't uh, develop bad smells, and they don't let insects grow inside, because most of them, at least in the first stages when the water is more concentrated, are uh, uh, subsurface flow, so the water is not in contact with the atmosphere. For you architects, uh, there are some creative designs nowadays about the wetlands. So the engineers are tending to do them. I'm a chemist, so I tell them only, I need uh, 100 square meters. And the engineers are every time designing a square a rectangle, or more rectangles, <laughs> one uh, beside the other. The architects are much more creative, and they are doing like this. Or uh, All these are uh, referred to animals. That's a turtle, uh, and so on, so the butterfly, yeah. and uh, uh, you can also make abstract uh, things. I mean, uh, a Kandinsky picture could uh, uh, fit well too, uh, it's up to you. There are some constraints, like the horizontal flow systems uh, must, must respect some uh, geometric constraints, but the vertical ones, not at all. Uh, it's only a matter of using every square meters you are uh, investing on, and so to have the water filter in there. <coughs> okay, uh, I advise for the this country the adoption of uh, the French reed beds, which are a French invention. They are treating the wastewater without any primary treatment, so the, all the raw wastewater is going in a, a first uh, bed, the, the one there. You have an accumulation of sludge in the time. Every 10 years, you get the sludge out, but it's composted, and you can use as a soil uh, amendment. And you see here some graphs. This is 13 years of continuous monitoring, and you see that we sometimes we have concentration of the organic content up to 10,000 milligrams per liter, which is really a very high concentration, and the outlet is constantly below 10, uh, 100. And also the other one is a system which is uh, realized in uh, Moldova, three hectares uh, for treating 30,000 uh, persons. And you see the graph there, the green line is the outlet, which is uh, about 10 milligram per liter. And uh, the, the, those are normal concentration for uh, um, municipal sewer. Uh, the nice thing is that this system is working at minus 35 degrees. So you can adopt it also in uh, the Himalaya mountains if you want. So the, these systems are also working in a cold climate. And that's...